enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey. Luke, we got a great show today. I'm excited about it. Um, we're bringing on Brian Forrester, who's basically been doing this stuff his whole life. He's traveled the world. He's seen, I don't even know how many mega lists this guy's been around, but he's seen a lot of cool stuff. He's been on a ton of TV shows, and man. It's awesome. Um, really, really interesting guy that kind of runs counter to the scientific narrative. Um, massively involved in the Paracas skulls and also megalith, megalithic studies. He's got a lot of very interesting ideas and theories around um, ancient construction. It's to do with the use of tools and finding tool marks on megaliths uh, in, in Egypt, Peru, Turkey, all over the place. It's really, really fascinating stuff that uh, most of what we'd call mainstream science wants to just go away. Yeah, I thought this would be a great follow-up with Travis because he's going to come back to back. So Travis had all this, you know, he had all these reports of this stuff happening but this guy's got more of like the physical bones the evidence and it's kind of a one-two punch for me so i'm really excited these two lined up together because you know you you dig up a lot of questions no pun intended like okay where are all these bones and then you have a guy like well let's get some answers this is the guy this guy i think is going to give us some answers to the questions that travis's episode brought up i'm really excited to dive into that do you have these bones and what are they so I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited as well. I'm, there's so much fascination around um, controversy, theories around the Paracas skulls and the elongated skulls and, and head wrapping. Um, and Brian's really been ground zero for all of this. They've done DNA testing. And we're going to let him just really unpack a lot of that. And it's pretty mind-blowing when you, when you start to hear about the origins of, of some of these skulls and the implications it has on just the, what we know about history and the narrative we've been fed about history. And Brian's a an expert, and we're very lucky to have him on the show today. Yeah, and uh, if you've been listening to this show, we're like five or six episodes in now, and if you love what you're hearing, go give us a review on iTunes. That's super helpful. Seriously, just click five stars even if you don't leave a review. More of those, the, the, the more we get going, the more we can get these bigger dogs on the show. And that's what it's all about is, is uh, getting the smart people to tell us the goods, piecing it all together, asking good questions. And the more ratings, the more the guests are like, I want to come on this show. This shows up. This seems like a re- the real deal. So that really helps us. And if you want to send us an email, blurrycreaturespodcast at gmail.com. Find us on all your favorite social media at blurrycreatures. We're growing. Instagram's almost 700 already, and it's uh, people are sending us messages, and that gives me the juice. When you tell me, hey, I'm loving your show, it just gives me like, whoo, a little pep in my step that day. You know and what I mean? Let me tell you, you want to give Nate the juice. Nate needs the juice. Give Nate the juice. And, and guys, just to go back to what he was saying, really what we're trying to do here is just provide a platform um, for people to come on and talk about the history you haven't been taught, um, to explore the places that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And really to open your mind to the idea there's a lot more out there that we don't know about. And we, Yesterday, Nate and I were talking about the idea that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of the ocean. Think about that. Um, and if that's the case in, here in Terrestrial, where we live, uh, what else could be out there? What else is out there? And what do we not know enough about? And that's really what we're chasing here on Blurry Creatures. Yeah. All right, so let's add Brian to the call.
Welcome to the show, Brian Forster. Uh, Brian, uh, I'm not going to lie. You've lived a pretty fascinating life. If you, anyone studies what you've been up to, um, you're one of the most interesting guys in the room, I think. Uh, and I, I played music for a long time. I was backstage with a lot of guys. And you would be the guy that I'd want to be sitting in the corner talking to because you've been all over the world. You've seen a lot of cool stuff. You've been on several TV shows, Ancient Aliens, Unsealed. You've been on one of my favorite shows, Coast to Coast Radio. And you spent two years, and this is this is just a few of the things, you spent two years building a sailing canoe, a 62-foot sailing canoe. Uh, you're an artist, explorer, craftsman, researcher, scientist, you name it. Uh, and I love the truth chaser spirit that you have. But right out of the gate, um, I think we could start at your journey when you were young. It says you started carving totem poles when you were 11, and we're a creatures podcast. And on the top of totem poles is the Thunderbird. That's a creature we haven't talked about. Do you have any thoughts on the these legendary birds or any stories about them? Yeah, I'm not sure if if, uh, if they actually still exist. It's a very strong tradition in the especially the west coast of Canada and other other native tribes. And of course, another character they have is they have a depiction of what we call Sasquatch. Uh, the female is called Sonaqua. And the male is called Bukwus, and that's of the Kwagyul people of the west coast of Canada. And they say, you know, it's been in, in the tradition of those people for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and they say they still do exist. So that's, you know, that's evidence that there really is what you call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. We have, we've got a Native American guy uh, uh, on the show, and he said that they were more the little people. <laughs> it's, it's, it, they think it's like this, a smaller creature. It's different than the Sasquatch, but... You know, it's a little bit blurry there, like what what these creatures are. So the the Thunderbird, I've I've read they've had sightings up to two thousand two, two thousand five. But you kind of jumped into the Bigfoot thing. Do you have any more thoughts about uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot? Um, is it related to some of the things you're doing now? Um, uh, not not really. It's just um, again on the west coast coast of Canada, the native people depict them uh, usually as the as the lowest figure on a on a totem pole, and uh, the Zonaqua represents wealth and abundance and supposedly is, has been used up until recent times as a way to scare the children because they, you know, the elders would say, if you go off into the forest by yourself, you'll be grabbed by one of these and you'll never come back. Yeah, I know. What's the significance of, of the level of the animals on the, on the totem pole? Is there something to that? When you say Sasquatch or whatever the native word is for that's on the bottom, Thunderbird is on the top. Is there a significance to that? And how did you even get into doing something like that? Well, as a, a person of European background, uh, growing up on, <clears throat> excuse me, the west coast of Canada, um, you know, the, the history of, of, the, of the colonial people is pretty short, like 150 years. And so I just thought, well, I'm, I'm sure the native people who have lived here for thousands of years know a hell of a lot more about the natural environment than what we do. That's what <laughs> kind of drew me, drew me into it. So I started getting involved in buying books about the, the art forms and um, just saw pictures of bowls and things that I, I would like to own, which are in museums. So I decided to buy some carving tools and try to replicate them. And it became my profession from the age of 25 to about 36, uh, where I carved totem poles and canoes and masks and boxes and bowls and paddles and things like that. So it's, it's not a family thing. My, my father, you know, questioned my sanity when I started to, because he, <laughs> he almost insisted that I, I go to university and become a brain surgeon, which didn't work out. But uh, he, he, he grew, grew to understand it after a while, I guess. And so in terms of the position, you know, they, t they talk about the, you know, the lo top man on the totem pole or, or whatever. What it is is basically the representation of the family lineage, so different animal characters uh, you would inherit from, um, you know, your grandmothers and grandfathers. So, the, like the bear figure or the the wolf or the frog, etc. So, I I don't think the actual position means that much. It's just it's a description of your uh, of the legends and, and stories of nature in your family. I'm sure you've heard some really cool stories as you were carving those things. People talking to you about them. Oh, you uh, bet. Uh, so. Just to give you kind of an idea of where we are on our show. So our last guest 
had over 700 newspaper articles. These compiled over 10 years from like 1860 to 1920 about giants being dug up in North America. And it's this weird conspiracy kind of thing. Like there are some accounts that have like 500 skulls and skeletons, eight foot to 10 foot tall in, a, in one cave. And then the Smithsonian or museums or, 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 or universities show up and these things go missing. And uh, we kind of want to talk about the physical evidence because he kind of was like, hey, there's evidence that these reports, these things happened. But you're like the guy that has the bones, has the skulls. Are they connected, these articles, to what you're finding and what you've discovered? Well, not really. Um, the skulls and skeletons that I've been looking at, which are literally <clears throat> less than half an hour from where I'm, I'm sitting right now on the coast of Peru, that's where this... Uh, major ancient cemetery is of five different cultures. Um, the first culture being called the Paracas people. And they, they were the ones that had elongated skulls. We have clear evidence that originally they were born with elongated skulls. And uh, then over the course of generations, they would start to mix in with more normal looking native people here on the coast of Peru. Uh, so we've done genetic testing, um, analysis by between 30 and 40 medical profession, foreign medical professionals have come and looked at them. And there are uh, lots of different um, anomalies with these original skulls that can't be explained uh, by, by medicine. And like none of these medical professionals has been able to um, fully understand them because they didn't study this in medical school. So for example, one thing that's mis missing is what's called the sagittal suture, which we all have, that comes down the, the center of our skull here, and that's completely missing. Also, the eye sockets are about 50% larger than normal. The jaw is much bigger than what we have. And um, so we're starting to think that these were not Homo sapiens sapiens, but probably a subspecies that I've called Homo sapiens paracas. And the unfortunate thing about that is that uh, we did do DNA testing, but when we went back to our Peruvian archaeologist in charge of the study to do more, he said, no, you're not allowed to. <laughs> he just cut the whole thing right off. That's crazy. I, I, I mean, a lot of the, my friends who, uh, from school and they've gone on to grad school, they kind of think that, you know, they have this sort of view of science that science is, <laughs> it's going to do whatever it takes to get the truth out, that it has this moral superior idea that it, that it subscribes to. But it feels like, from everything I've read about you and all these people who are around this subject, you can present raw data, actual evidence, and it's not enough. It's like, we don't know what that is, but there's not like this huge team of scientists to come down and like jump in, right? It, is that sort of been your experience? Like you're sort of alone? Yeah, de <clears throat> definitely. That's the sad thing about, um, because in order to do a proper study, we had to use uh, samples from skulls from an institution or a museum. So we contacted the Ica Regional Museum and got their top archaeologist to get involved because I asked him two questions. I said, number one, are you 100% sure of where this Paracas culture came from? And he said, no. And then I said, can you explain why they had genetically red hair? And he said, no. So I said, okay, well, how about if we do some DNA testing? And he, he cooperated with it. But the process took about three years to get simply the certification from the government to do it. And then we got the results. And <clears throat> only two of the samples turned out to match Native American DNA. He, he got the, um, all, all of the data and all the information before we did uh, a major announcement in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. So he had it, and then I waited for a month to contact him, and I said, have you written your report? And he said, uh, yeah, I have. And I said, are you going to write a major paper? And he said, no. And um, basically the problem is that the DNA didn't match what he wanted. He wanted it to be Native American, and it turned out not to be. And that's why I also said that when we went back to him to, uh, to do some more testing, he said, nope, you're not, you're, you're not going to do that through me. Wow. So, so, Brian, I know I've listened to some of the things that you've, you've done and put out there. And one of the things you talk about is the DNA actually traces these 
these skulls, the skulls that actually are not not wrapped, the ones that genetically are elongated, back to the Black Sea area. And we talk about we talk about red hair. What is your theory on how these ended up in Peru? Well, they had to have migrated, obviously, by by ocean, <clears throat> and it is theoretically possible. I've, I've studied the um, the winds and currents uh, from the Black Sea all the way to the coast of Peru, and it is feasible that they could have done that, like almost four thousand years ago, because the only uh, of all the uh, maternal DNA results that we got, the only area that matches that is around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So some, uh, you know, some researchers, researchers have said that they were Middle Eastern or European, but it's actually Eurasian. And uh, as well, the largest other um, elongated skulls in the world are found in that location. So it's mm. not only physically do the skulls look very, very similar, if not exactly the same, but the DNA matches as, as well. And why, you know, why... It's all being ignored, I don't know, but that's why I do interviews in YouTube, because I have to get the information out. If, if the yeah. academics are not interested, then bypass them. How many megaliths, uh, uh, megalithic sites are there estimated around the world, and how many have you been to? Maybe we can kind of give a scope of where, what your knowledge is about this. <clears throat> there are a lot of megalithic sites around Cusco, Peru, which was the capital of the Inca. So that's up in, <clears throat> excuse me, the Andes. And then also in Bolivia and Easter Island and Egypt, of course, and Lebanon and um, Greece and where else? Baalbek, Lebanon, oh, Petra in Jordan and other locations in Jordan. So it's mainly kind of of the, the Middle East area and uh, Peru and Bolivia in general, but also e Easter Island, there's evidence that there were two different cultures living there. You know, the, you get the same story over and over again. Um, you know, the people talk about Easter Island as being a place where the Poly <coughs> Polynesians arrived about a thousand years ago, but they were incapable of creating the really giant Moai, you know, head figures, which are full bodies. That's clearly evident. I've been there three times. I've, I've been to most of the of the locations um, so far. Uh, there are also megalithic sites in Saudi Arabia, which would be difficult to get to. But it, it's kind of th that general area. I mean, they're everywhere. And a lot, from what I've understood, some of the, the temple mounds and the worship mounds are they the same thing as these megalithic sites, or are they are they connected? Um, I don't. I don't think they're considered megalithic sites, but they seem to have show signs and evidence that they could have been something. Um, yeah, well, for, from what I've heard, um, with a lot of those uh, sites around Ohio and you know that kind of area, the native people say our ancestors didn't make these. Yeah. So it's another story of people moving into you know and discovering something that was already there, and just the scale, like uh, Cahokia you know, is a massive complex and serpent, you know, serpent mound and all of these things. Um, a lot of them, of course, have been destroyed, too, over the course of time by farmers and people like that. So, um, yeah, they could, could very well be that they're several thousand years older than um, what standard academia uh, says. Brian, I, I have a question on that. And this has been fascinating to me. I've watched a bunch of your YouTube stuff talking about how there, like dynastic Egypt, uh, Gobekli Tepe, in these different places, you are actually able to see more advanced technology that predates, or more advanced technology bu building techniques that predate what would be the dynastic or what would be the the add-on stuff. So everything that was added on to these sites is actually cruder and and less technologically advanced than what predates it. And so, I know that you talk also about saw marks and tool marks um, that you find on, in some of these sites across the world. Talk about, can you just unwrap for some of our listeners, talk about what predates what we know and, and what your thoughts are about what happened before in, in sort of the pre prehistoric um, times with these, with these giant structures, you have rocks that look like they're laser cut or cut so, so finely and so accurately that they fit together without any mortar. And you have these, you have looks like drill holes at pyramids and, and things like that. Can you unwrap some of that stuff for us and for our listeners that maybe aren't familiar with 
with the technological stuff that you talk about that maybe predates our history? Sure. Well, uh, actually, that's um, in the case of Egypt, that's why <clears throat> when we do a, a tour in Egypt, we start in the south. <clears throat> Most tours will do like the Giza Plateau, and, and, and that's like the ultimate experience. And then after that, they'll look at the smaller temples. But we start in the south on purpose <clears throat> because that's where most of dynastic Egypt is and dynastic we're talking about culture starting about five and a half thousand years ago you know the pharaohs etc and there you see almost all of the constructions are made of sandstone or, or limestone which are not very hard you know very hard material so it, it is possible that those structures were done using bronze chisels and things like that and then we work our way up the Nile and when you get into the area of Thebes, that's where you have Karnak and, um, and Luxor. And there you see two very distinct styles of construction. You see the, the dynastic work in limestone and sandstone where you have like columns that are sections put together. Yeah. Then in the same location, you'll have obelisks, which are one piece of granite, which is a very hard stone. And these huge seated figures of pharaohs made of one piece of stone that are, you know, like 20 feet tall, made of granite and sometimes quartzite, which are very hard stones that cannot be shaped by bronze chisels. So clearly, we're seeing examples of uh, some culture that had very advanced high technology. The same thing with the construction of the Great Pyramid is 2.3 million multi-ton blocks. There's no way that was done by a bunch of slaves or um, you know, a anyone like that, they, they had to have been constructed using very advanced technology because recent evidence has shown that a lot of the limestone that makes up the Great Pyramid came from not Giza, but from Cairo. So every one of those blocks had to be cut, moved across the Nile, and then taken up onto the Giza Plateau, which, com you know, complicates it. <laughs> also, granite being brought from Aswan in the south into the king's chamber where you have slabs that weigh up to 50 tons, you know, perfectly fitting together with no mortar. Yeah. That's the difference is that when you look at the dynastic work, you see uh, mortar used in the construction. In Peru, when you look at the Inca work, you, you see mortar used in the construction. But in the pre-Inca stuff, the stones fit perfectly together. And in a lot of cases, Every stone is a different shape and size, which is not a logical way of building something. But it, it shows very advanced thought, very advanced capability. And you know what's funny is because you've worked with your hands a lot in your life, so you understand how to build things. And I've remodeled three houses myself, so I understand. I mean, it took like four or five dudes just to lift a countertop into my kitchen. So we're talking, you know, if you don't have some real world experience working with your hands, this stuff doesn't sound too crazy, but it is. I mean, these things are, uh, I mean, there was that one block, I think it's in Lebanon, that's, uh, it looks like the size of a two semi trucks. And it's, I think it's what, like, the the biggest block that they have in a megalithic site is that in Lebanon I think yeah that's Baalbek there's it's it's uh, erroneously called the stone of the pregnant woman it's actually a bad translation from French what it should be is the foundation stone and it weighs one thousand two hundred tons and recently <laughs> right 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 next to it they discovered another one that they uncovered that's one thousand six hundred tons. Wow. Unbelievable. In in the quarry and the actual site where they were to be moved to is about a mile away, and of course there are theories that they, uh, you know, they created giant wheels that they put at either end of these big blocks to roll them the mile to get the, you know just stupid ideas. Why they can't simply state that they don't know how this was done, you know, that would be the proper and logical answer. You know, how much do you think? How much do you think giants like because because like, for instance, in the news articles, the biggest one that we had in the news articles was 18 foot tall and it was discovered in Franklin, Tennessee, 60 feet down in this cavern. And these guys pulled it out. They had a bunch of scientists look at it. And this was like from 1870. So if if we have I mean, that's that's a that's not that's not proof that those things existed. But if we have some evidence that maybe these things walked around, what if you had 30 foot tall giants? Do you think they could build this stuff? If they existed? Well, they still would have had to have had very advanced technology. It doesn't, doesn't really matter the size of the, of the person or the size of the being because we see the machine marks. Like at, at Petra in Jordan, 
which is a massive site. Most people think about uh, what's called the, the Treasury from the Indiana Jones film. But Petra is seven miles long, and it has chamber after chamber. Some, some of the chambers that were carved wow. out of the bedrock were uh, 300,000 cubic feet. <laughs> where, where are the most obvious or most overt examples in your mind that where we, we're seeing machine marks and tool marks that of advanced technology that predates the following construction? Well, I, actually, I would say Petra in Jordan is the best example um, because you see, <clears throat> you see machine marks all over the place. In general, they're, it's almost like some kind of raking a system that was like clawing away at the stone and there are three like there's a roughing tool a middle tool and then a very fine finishing tool and you see that literally everywhere um and you have to be there to see, like you have to be there to see it you can't look at a picture and go oh those are the tool marks but i've been to petra twice and it's it's just it's in your face it almost looks like these things are melted into place like the blocks are so perfect it looks like you know, you were t if you're a kid building like with Legos and you're literally s putting together. I mean, if you could take granite Legos and that's how tight they fit together. You literally can't. Do you think they're melted into place? Some sort of high heat, some some intense uh, power source they could tap into, maybe spiritually tap into to melt this stuff or lift this stuff. Well, yeah, that's uh, the best examples of that is around or are around Cusco in Peru. And um, that's where you find the megalithic walls, walls where every stone is a different shape and size, uh, different numbers of facets on them. And you can't fit a human hair in the join. So the latest theory is that whoever was able to do this work, they had the capability of extracting the stone from the original quarry, probably floating it you know, through the air somehow, and then transforming it into a, almost like a marshmallow material and then setting it into place where it would fit in, it would fill in the void where it, it uh, was put and then would that would simply lock it in with all the other ones. Yeah. And again, that's, that's a granite type stone, so there's no way the Inca could have done it. Kind of like they could do glass blowing with granite rocks, you know what I mean? Something Eat them up. like that. Brian, I, I've got a question about all this. So how do people simply forget or or lose the ability to do these advanced techniques um, in the ways that we see across across the country or across the, across the world when it comes to these megalithic sites. Well, we we do know there was a series of, of massive cataclysms that occurred between thirteen thousand and twelve thousand years ago. Well, that's been proven by science, by geology, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the the, the planet was impacted by something for about a thousand years, uh, including most likely um, plasma ejection from the sun and stuff like that, because we do see sc uh, stone scorching on the western surfaces in places like Egypt and in Pet <coughs> excuse me in Petra as well. On the on the western side, you see these the blackened marks of where the sandstone was vape. Basically, the surface was vaporized. So that's that's the actual evidence, and so that would have. Um, if it did involve plasma, which, which struck at very, very high temperature, that would vaporize any living life form. This sounds to me like Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. Yeah. Like there's, is, do you believe that happened and like something like that happened? Where, Because the, the, the giant's account, from my understanding, the biblical account, is that these beings were supernatural. Right, the Nephilim. Yeah, the Nephilim yeah. from Genesis 6. I mean, they could have been sort of doing these experiments and then that's why the city is destroyed but you have physical evidence science evidence say hey look some sort of you know something supernatural destroyed this place right is that kind of what i'm hearing well yeah i think it was a a series of natural forces that that did this uh the curious thing is that when you drive from uh, beirut to go to Baalbek, you pass by on the, on the right hand side is Mount Hermon, yeah, creepy looking mountain covered in snow, and that you know that's where the Bible says that the the you know these the ones from above came you know came down and bred yeah. with the daughters of men, and that's and where, in exchange they got technology, and that's where Jesus does his transfiguration, right, where he's supposed to go on the mountain and do his his own supernatural event, from what I've read. 
How much do you subscribe to the Bible's uh, accounts of archaeology, history? Uh, have you found that, do they confirm things that you've found in places you've been or challenge them? Well, that's the great thing about the Bible is that every day they're making discoveries in and, in and around Israel that support the Bible. You know, literally on almost on a daily basis. And one thing that happened was, um, I think about 10 years ago, uh, a series of dump trucks went underneath Temple Mount and came out the back. I think it was something like 300 truckloads or something. Like they took out all this debris um, and then dumped it in, I'm not sure if it was the Hedron Valley, but it was one of the valleys in Jerusalem. Um, and so a, a uh, uh, Israeli archaeologist asked the government if he could sift through these like, basically mountain of material. And so far they've taken out something like 100 and 30,000 artifacts from the biblical period wow. because what they were trying to do is, uh, you know, the, the keepers of Temple Mount at the moment were trying to hide the evidence of any Jewish occupation. <laughs> you know, All so right. far 150,000 artifacts. Wow. That's, that's why I really wanted to go in, in March. At the end of our um, Egyptian tour, we were supposed to go to Israel for a week, but of course they closed the borders and everything because there are megalithic stones in a tunnel underneath Temple Mount. One of them's 600 tons. Wow. Do you think, do you think like there's some sort of supernatural force to keep this information from getting out into the world? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say a supernatural force. I think there, there are evil people who are trying to hide this information, and that's why it's important to release it. I mean, with the elongated skulls, with the megalithic stuff, you know, I've been able to produce pretty simple, logical um, arguments for the existence of all of this stuff. It doesn't, you know, it's not rocket science when you see a stone that weighs 1,200 tons, you know, and say, well, this couldn't have been done with hand tools. It doesn't matter how many people you have with chisels. It's just, it's an impossible undertaking for the time period that academics are insisting, you know, when all of this happened. I've heard a lot of people say when they're trying to push the truth out or uncover these things that they have, weird things happen to them. There's some sort of force against this truth getting out. Have you had any weird experiences that you can't explain? Like you're trying to put this stuff out on the table and then a tornado blows through or, what, you know, whatever. Like, have you had any weird pushback? Um, I wouldn't say so much pushback. Um, certain doors have been closed to me, uh, especially, as I said, in regards to the DNA testing, but uh, the good thing is that um, what that means is that we're not allowed to do testing of, uh, of skulls that are in like a, a, a public or national museum, but it doesn't mean that we can't do testing of skulls that are in a private collection, because I asked our archaeologist at five different occasions, I said, what about if it's in a private collection? He said, well, that's not under our jurisdiction. So that gives me the green light. And the, and, the, and the important thing about the megalithic stuff is if somebody opens a door for you, you go through the door. And that was right. the case at a location called the Osirion in, in Egypt, which is this underground complex, you know, megalithic complex. And uh, we've, on previous occasions, we've been allowed down there for maybe like three minutes and then been told to come back out. But the last wow. time I was there in March, um, <clears throat> I asked our Egyptian guide if I could go down. He said, no, but he said, give me a minute. And then he went over and talked to the, um, the senior official who was outside. And about two minutes later, that guy took me down the stairs and let me have access to the Assyrian for half an hour. Wow. What's down there? <clears throat> well, it's a, it's a rectangular a structure built underground out of uh, quartzite, like giant quartzite blocks and granite blocks. And then on the right-hand side, you can go inside of it. And there's a tunnel that's about um, 100 feet long that has a, like a corbelled roof made of huge slabs. And then when you go to the other end, there's another tunnel that goes on for about 350 to 400 feet and goes to a, a locked gate. Unfortunately, the gate wasn't open, but it's it's a huge. It's much bigger than I thought it was. The only way to be able to see it 
was on that occasion um, and is probably connected to a bunch of other tunnel systems that I've been in in Egypt as well. They talk about a huge system of tunnels going north, south, east and west under the Giza Plateau, maybe going as far as Karnak, you know, on and on it goes. That's wild. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, like, I heard so many stories of friends traveling where you have to, like, bribe people, bring cash, do all kinds of weird stuff, because this stuff's not easy to access. People think, oh, we could just go over there and walk in this thing, and it seems really complicated. Like, no, there's lots of jurisdiction, who's in charge, what? Do you find that a lot, where you, it's just no access allowed, and you have to finagle ways to get in? Yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, that's why you have to find the person. There's always somebody who has the key to anything. So you just have to find out who that person is. And it depends upon, you know, their personality, how they're feeling that day. Because nothing, you know, when they say something's off limits, that means how much. Right, right. If you get the right combination of how much and who, then it works. There's an, yeah. a, another site called the Osiris Shaft, which is on the Giza Plateau, that goes 200 feet vertically into the bedrock. And wow. I've had access to that twice so far. It cost... $2,400 for two hours, but we had a group with us, so it was about 60 bucks each, and we had access to that for two hours. I was able to film the whole thing, mm. uh, and that, that, you know, that had only, has only been open for, I think, two years, maybe three years now. So there's the pure evidence of the existence of this. Also, recently, the Step Pyramid at Saqqara in Egypt was off, you know, you could go walk around the outside of it, on like two sides of it, and that was it. If you kept trying to go farther, somebody would take out their gun and point it, you know, point it at you. Oh, they opened up the underground chambers of that place, so I was able to film that. Uh, that'll be coming up on my, um, on my YouTube channel pretty soon, but there's a whole network system underneath the step pyramid um, at Saqqara. So that's the great thing about Egypt is that they're actually opening up more stuff as time goes on, whereas other countries are trying to sh uh, close things off. Why do you think, uh, this is a question just on a more broader, but why do you think there's such a resistance to, to outlying evidence that runs counter to the narrative? That seems to be the biggest thing here, right? Is that for whatever reason, you, discovering things, DNA, um, you know, finding out these interesting things about the skulls and, and megaliths is so just suppressed, it seems. And because it just, I don't I understand. Like, it, it, you'd think that science would be open to, in a sense, what science to learning and to, and to, to refining the, the narrative. And yet there seems to be so much resistance against the things that you're finding and discovering and doing. And this is something we're kind of seeing across the, the board, when it, even when it comes to the creatures things we talk about. People, people are very, very quick to squash anything that doesn't fit that preferred narrative. And why do you think that is? Well, it's the desperate attempt to pro uh, protect a very limited paradigm. That's the problem. Is that, you know, you go to university and your professor tells you, this is who did that, and this is when they did it. But it's easy now to pick all that stuff apart. Like, that's the whole function of, of, uh, of YouTube is for me, is, is to pick this stuff apart in a very simple, logical way, like saying, this material is harder than the tool that that culture had. So right. that tool can't cut that stone. Yeah. And also, the, like the presence, like I said, at, at Petra, and also you see on the Giza Plateau and area, uh, you see obvious, like, machining marks. And when people say, um, well, maybe that was recent, it's like some of these sites are located a half hour drive from any power outlet and the efficiency of, of the drills in the case of a site called Abu Sir is that the uh, engineers have estimated the the efficiency of the cutting of those uh, circular holes is 300 times more efficient than what diamond tools can do wow. so they'll talk about again you know like a copper tube and then some coarse sand and they were rubbing it back and it's like no <laughs> you know, these are spirals going in penetrating at two to three millimeters per revolution we don't have that technology so that by you know one core drill hole shows you the whole story the whole story
I, I kind of want to get back to the creature thing because that's mostly what we are. But uh, uh, I want to ask you one question real quick. What's it like? So all the megalithic sites and the things you've seen, what stands out as like this is your favorite and why? And then we can get back to the skulls. Okay. Well, actually, I guess my favorite site is Puma Punku in Bolivia because it is otherworldly. It's the, the quality of the workmanship is like almost laser flat. Again, academics will say that this was a Bronze Age culture that did, you know, that did this work. And it's like, no, I've been, I think I've been there 55 times now. It's about um, wow. seven miles from Lake Titicaca, just over the border in Bolivia. It's at 13,000 feet above sea level. And it's unique. Whatever culture did that didn't do any other work anywhere else. It doesn't look like the stuff in Peru. doesn't look like the stuff in Egypt or, or anywhere else. So it's, it's probably the weirdest place and nobody who works there knows anything about, you know, knows anything about it, never questions anything about the location. The fact that uh, a lot of the stone is magnetic and was moved 55 miles from, from a wow. quarry on top of a dormant volcano, you know. That's crazy. It is. Yeah, that's, that I, you know, I don't really have a favorite, but I, I would say that's the weirdest place. I've ever hmm. been, and that's why I keep going back, because every time, it's like a giant book opens up, and I'm allowed to read one more page in the book, and then the book closes again. That's that's how it kind of slowly releases itself to me. If you're an open-minded person, you have to, to just say, I don't believe the narrative, and it seems like science suffers from this groupthink problem where it can't explore these issues, and then people are afraid to admit that we don't know. We don't know what happened. We don't know how this stuff was built. And with the Giants thing, I want to kind of want to get back to that uh, and the skulls. I mean, you've shown these skulls to people, probably doctors and physicians and scientists. What are they? I mean, you're looking at a skull that's almost, what, 40% bigger than a normal human head. And what do they say? What do they do? How do they react? Um, well, in general, the like the oldest ones are, of course, the natural ones, and they look much different from what we call cranial deformation or, or head binding, because they're so complex in terms of the curvature that there's no way you could bind somebody's head and make it, you know, baby's head and make it form that way. And so they are, are of course, the most mysterious, and they're the oldest, and no physician that we've ever had who's looked at them in person can explain what they are because they didn't study that in medical school the lack of the suture the volume the shape <clears throat> the fact that the form and magnum which is where your spinal column enters um the bottom of your skull is an inch back from where it sh should be you know that is a genetic characteristic of something so none of them can explain it and uh how many of these skulls do you have access to or have in well luckily um i have access to the senior juan navarro museum which is about a 20 minute drive from where i'm at and there are 45 of them in there some of them are the old natural shape other ones are obviously um head binding because as over the course of time these people had to breed with normal humans and over the course of hundreds of years the natural human uh traits would start taking over. That's why at the very end, you simply have the flattening of the forehead and the back of the skull. Whereas uh, in the beginning, you have, you know, again, this very complicated uh, skull shape. Are these, are these normal sized for that time? Or, or do we not know? Or we just have the skull? Or do you have the rest of the body to say these are pretty much the same standard size you would, of human being in, in that sense across, across the, the globe at that, at that time period? No, I, actually, the, the average Native American living in Peru today is about five foot four, five foot five. And these people were five foot ten to six foot two. So, they're so that's a relatively larger person. <laughs> One thing I know about humans is we love to mimic. Do you, know, do you see that? Why would you take a baby's head that's human and try to make it look like something else? Unless you're, unless you're seeing something else, right? Yeah, definitely. It, it has to be based on something because you wouldn't do something as dangerous as binding a baby's head unless it was important. You know, if you wanted to look different from the, the common folk, you could wear a fancy hat or something, but right. do something that complicated and where would that knowledge have come from to begin with? So that's the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we find. Also, the Spanish discovered when they first entered Peru 
and got into Cusco, they noticed that there were people who had elongated heads and had very light uh, colored skin. And when they asked the native people, who, who are these people? Because they have lighter skin than we do and we're European. They said, well, th those are the last of the ancient Viracocha pe people. So there was a bloodline that was maintained, is yeah. what the thought process. And was right. this, a, like, when we talk about the, the head binding, is, is this a, a, a ruling class, kind of elitist thing, where it was it was a sign of, of class, or a sign of a, a ruling class, or is, is, is that the theory, that, that these people with elongated skulls were actually the, sort of in charge, or the elites? Yeah, they were the, the nobility, they were the priestly class, and what you would call the king, like the kingly class as well. And that's what most people don't know about the Inca, was that the Inca were a royal family. Uh, Inca doesn't describe everybody who lived in, in that part of Peru. It's only the noble family who were the Inca. And they would only um, breed with those outside if there were characteristics that they wanted. Like if, if someone was very attractive, then they could be married into the Inca family in order to enhance the, the beauty or the intellect, or the athleticism of future generations. They let you in, Luke. <laughs> Just for my beard abilities, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, is this why we see like some of those Egyptian hieroglyphs of these big pharaohs with giant heads? That yeah, that's actually the the funny thing is that's only during the Akhenaten time time period, eighteenth okay. dynasty, and he had his daughters depicted as having elongated heads, and again. The artisans would have to have had something to base their, you know, their study on in order to do that very complex portrayal. Time period-wise, what are we talking about for these elongated skulls? Because are you seeing a crossover like these people from the Black Sea ended up in Egypt, and that's maybe how they figured it out? And these were all kind of were these time periods in in concert with each other as far as we can date this stuff? Well, in terms of head binding, it was most common about two thousand years ago so on the coast you know parts of peru bolivia melanesia the congo stonehenge uh, europe eurasia uh, the, the egypt one though we still don't know because it was an art artistic portrayal uh akhenaten's body was never found even though zahi hawass of supreme council of antiquities insisted that he found akhenaten just like he he said he found Nefertiti, which he, he never did. Mm. They mysteriously disappeared. I think what Akhenaten was, was saying through having his daughters look that way in their portraiture was, this is where our bloodline comes from. We are descended from Osiris, and Osiris was real. He wasn't a, a fictitious being. Because Osiris is always depicted as having an elongated head, too. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You know, you grow up in, you know, if you grow up in church or anything, they, they, they make it sound like the stuff in the Old Testament was uh, just allegory. It didn't actually happen. But we have some weird stuff in the Bible, like the ten plagues and then the Pharaoh's staffs turning to a snake. Uh, you know, you grow up reading this stuff and you're like, nah, I don't know if that really happened. But, I mean, you look at these megaliths and you're like, maybe they had this supernatural ability to do stuff that we can't do today. And do you think that might be subscribed to these big-headed people, that they had supernatural abilities? It, yeah, it could very well be. It, it, that could have been the, the extra, the reason why they had to have, or why they had uh, more cranial volume than, than what we had, because they had higher powers. And maybe that's also why on the coast of Peru they were doing brain surgery more than 2,000 years ago. Wow. Because somebody got banged on the, on the side of the head, you know, in a, in a battle. But that they were trying to trigger this ancient <coughs> capability to come back. And like I said, on a daily basis, they're making discoveries in, in Israel that back up the Bible. You know, it's only recently that they found the city of David, which they've now proven was where King David's palace was. That's amazing. It was a parking lot 15 years ago. Yeah. That little country has so much history that is being proven scientifically now. That's, you know, that's why I really wanted to go. I wanted to go because I wanted to see, you know walk the path of Jesus, but then when I started to see there, there's megalithic stuff there, it's like, whoa! This is so unbelievably fascinating to me that these, and like, like Nate was saying, I really think that like a lot of these things, we continually find things that lead credence to, to biblical accounts and biblical places, and 
it keeps proving that what were what what was you know written down and recorded is factual um which i think also plays into exactly what we're talking about with our blurry creatures and and the nephilim and understanding how these things fit into a narrative that is i would say more truthful than the one that we're fed on a daily basis by by the scientific and academic community yeah definitely it seems like there's a war going on in the minds of the minds of people you have this battle every day to figure out like what 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 you're being told versus what you're seeing do you feel like a strong conviction to the truth is it the truth that you're after what is it you're that's that's pushing you forward every day well, yeah, it's it's uh, it's sharing the obvious evidence that what we've been taught is not the full picture. Uh, you know, the megalithic stuff, the elongated, you know, all of this stuff. It doesn't fit the paradigm. And the good thing, though, is that as these professors, etc., in charge are getting older and you know approach retirement or actually retiring or whatever there are younger people taking their place that are more open-minded and and know about this stuff our, our great um, new guide in Egypt was that way he would he would on the tour he would pull me off to the side and tell me stuff that was just like just mind-boggling because he knows this stuff is true mm -hmm. he said that there's a underneath the step pyramid of Saqqara there is a megalithic city not just that there's a chamber, but he said it goes down and down and down and down. There's also an area um, near the Osirion. There's a mountain in behind the Osirion uh, where he said, which is, of course, completely off limits, but he was allowed access to the com that complex. And he said they got in there, started going underground at 8 o'clock in the morning and came out at 4.30 in the afternoon. It just kept going and going and going. Wow. And there's there's reports that these giants lived underground. I mean, that's in the mythology, that's in our history. What megalithic evidence or archaeological evidence have you found support the giants like big doors or big steps or things that may may that these creatures walk the earth? Sure. Well, there are, you know, there are doorways in places like Egypt and in the highlands of Peru that are are twice as large or twice as tall as they should be if they're just for normal looking people and there's you know there's no reason to build something of that scale unless it was used by somebody of that scale you wouldn't just build it and say look it's a big door that we can go through you know it makes us feel impressive so it, you know there's a logic to the idea that uh, the sense of sheer scale was for life forms that were much bigger than what we are uh, of course the, the bible has all the accounts of um, you know the stories of David and Goliath and all of the, you know, all the other stories of, of the deal with giants uh, <clears throat> that appeared in, in the times of Noah and then afterwards as well, you know, that they, that they lived on. That's something that author L.A. Marzulli has been doing a lot of work on and some, some other people. So, um, you know, the, the great thing is that there's so many, so many people now experiencing this stuff in person. That's the function of our tours is for people to be able to be hands-on with this stuff and be able to film and take pictures, to take home to show you know, their friends and family to spread the information even more. So um, getting any pushback from academia is meaning less and less as time goes on because there are more eyes and hands on this stuff. And nobody has ever been able to, to tell me that the Inca built the megalithic stuff or that the dynastic Egyptians built the megalithic stuff because when you're there you just go it's night and day you see stuff that we could do with hand tools and stuff you couldn't do with the most advanced machining machinery we have today yeah we talked about this a little yesterday that like Joe Rogan and those kinds of guys are to be able to they can bring an expert on their show and talk to millions of people and we can circumnavigate the university systems and say hey do with this information what you will it's almost like technology has given information to everybody and the universities can't control it anymore. And it's almost like they're pushing the temple down in a way. Like, they're so afraid of this information. It seems that, you know, that, that some guy could come down, film a video, and it could go on YouTube, and millions of people can see this skull. That's, you know, but then they all go, well, it's fake. It's a fake skull. And I think that's what I've heard every single time someone talks about the elongated skulls. They're all fake. I mean, you've, you've been around these things for a long time. Can you 
speak to the skeptics that these things are fake? They're not fake. I mean, they have found some mummies in the area of Nazca that look like they were fabricated. Uh, you know, they look alien, but they, they look like somebody had, had altered or put bones together that shouldn't have been put together. That that I can say, but there's no way that these are that these are fake because I've seen too many of them. And they are on public display in universities and museums in Peru. So uh, they also have 400 mummy bundles in <clears throat> the back rooms of the major museum in Lima that are, are the full elongated skull mummies. Wow. There's lots of physical evidence. And every once in a while, since, I, you know, I, as I said, I live half an hour from where the uh, graveyard is, where the oldest elongated skulls have been found. There's only one graveyard where you find them. And there's no way that these are fake. And there's no way that um, the oldest ones are simple head binding, because as we've discussed, they're way too complicated. And, uh, you know, we can D we've DNA tested them. They're actually working on the uh, nuclear DNA right now, which is the, the mass or the male side, the father side. So hoping for results from that pretty soon. But we've, we've uh, DNA tested more than 20 of these elongated skulls. And Brian. most of the results are not Native American. So that means migration from somewhere <laughs> <laughs> long before Columbus even the red, The red it. hair would give that away, but... <laughs> yeah, the red hair, too. Some people say, well, you know, black hair over the course of time turns red. It's like, no, it doesn't. It becomes <laughs> brittle and it falls apart. Right. If you have ancient red hair, it means that person had ancient red hair. So, Brian, in wrapping this up, tell us about... Uh, where you are, what you're doing, where people can find you online, uh, about your tours, about how Nate and I can come on a tour. <laughs> because I want once this world opens up and stops burning, I want I would love to do that. That sounds incredible. But yeah, where can people find you? Um, the things you put up. I know you have a big YouTube channel. You guys do tours. Just fill us in and plug plug your. Uh, you've written a, I mean, dozens and dozens of books as well. So if you want to give us a rundown. Well, basically, everything about me is, is at my website, which is www.hiddenincatours.com. Most of the content is free, but that's also where you have access to, you know, links to my 1,500 YouTube videos and uh, 37 books, thousands of photographs, um, articles, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everything about me is, is located right there. Um, and of course the tours there are no tours at present because of this little international uh, problem we're having um, <laughs> whose name should not be given that's you know I, I, I basically went in March I went to Egypt for two weeks and I didn't get back to Peru for another three and a half months <laughs> wow. so I'm, I'm, fi I'm finally home you know, I've been here for about a month so far but uh, wow. Moving around, you know, I, I can go locally. Like, I, I can go to Nazca, which is about a four-hour drive. But uh, in terms of major movement, just have to, you know, watch day by day as events unravel. I, I think this whole thing is a con job. And I hopefully most people will, over the course of time, figure that out too. That the probability of catching this is almost zero. The chance of dying is almost zero. And so, you know... Hopefully yeah. the world's waking up, and hopefully the world so. will start op opening up too. I uh, hope so as well. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm I'm worried that these, and just a small note, I'm worried that they're going to push this vaccine on, on everybody and not let us travel without it. And that's one of my big concerns about this. And 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 also joining one of your tours would be that we'd have to be papered um, in order to, to do that. Regardless, anyway, Brian, it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you for joining us all the way from Peru. Yeah, and. We would lo love to have you back when you have time and once we get these nuclear studies back to talk more about how this, how the elongated skulls fit into fit into the to hist history and to the greater narrative. And really, in some ways, the, this per these people are some of the blurry creatures we talk about because they're on the fringes. And very exciting to hear your updates. Uh, everybody check Brian Forrester out um, out of his website. And um, thanks again. This, is, this has been awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on our show. Like you've you've done a lot of big stuff, and this is really cool that you take some, take an hour of your time. You're a busy man, hard to lock down, but I love that because you're out there doing it, chasing it down. 
I'm locked down at the moment, but it won't, won't be forever. As soon <laughs> yeah. as I can, I'm on my way back out the door. All righty. So appreciate you. Okay, great. Thank you. Dude, that guy was that guy was so rad. Dude, he looks just like uh, is it like Robert Redford and somebody else. I really wanted to talk more about how the connections of of the Giants to the elongated skulls. It seems like there's some there's some connection there, but I mean, in my opinion, dude, you had an ancient world where you had a bunch of people walking around with giant heads, and then you had a bunch of humans trying to mimic that. Because right. if you imagine, I mean, say let's let's say the Travis's account is true. We had dwarves walking around. We had giants walking around. We had horn creatures walking around. Who knows what else was walking around? We had these elongated skull beings that maybe were twenty foot tall. You'd want to look like them. Sounds like yeah. Narnia, doesn't it? <laughs> You'd want to look and act like them, and that's why I think they shape their babies' heads to be. Oh well, you have a normal he- human. Well, my baby is smarter than yours because look, it's got this head. Right, and it's like it makes you think Tolkien wasn't too far off in his vision of Middle Earth. And and maybe that's really maybe prehistoric times actually looked a lot more like that and a lot less like the, the sanitized version of history or the the narrative we've been we've been fed in school and university definitely and you know, it's interesting it'll be interesting to see how the dna comes back because i i think what maybe what academia is most worried about is that they're going to find out there is a you know a parallel hominid that lived right alongside right alongside humans, but wasn't exactly human. You know, how how do you rationalize that with you know all of the different things that we've been told are foundational truths, like you know, like Darwinism is pre- you know preached as I would say preached because it really science is really a religion has been preached as you know as gospel. It really makes it hard to to rationalize any of that in the space of there was something that was a kind of a hybrid human that lived alongside of us, right? Like that. Yeah, I mean it's it's. Stuff is wild, man. It's a, it's a. It isn't a theory. It is a dogma that you must prescribe to. And if you challenge it, if you pull out some rocks that, or some skulls or whatever it is that say, "Hey, look, we don't know what this stuff is." Nope. Right. Shelf and, it. Shelf and listen, it. Listen, I think I think you made a decent point too when we talk about blurry creatures in the sense of giants. When it and I think Brian's whole outlook on megaliths really does prescribe to the to the idea that we had advanced people advanced beings that were able to do things move things whether it be by brute force which we, we would you know prescribe to what we see biblically with giants and and the nephilim i think that all kind of plays into a really actually believable theory when it comes to why we have such crazy construction that predates all of what we yeah. call dynastic history right you know, and then yeah. you got to. I encourage everyone to go watch the YouTube videos too. This guy holds up his his electronic level on on Megalist to find that these things are like a perfectly laser <laughs> level, and these <laughs> these sheer these sheer cuts are like laser precision cuts. Where you know he'll say in these videos, it's going to be done with like a diamond tipped saw or or tungsten carbide, which didn't exist until this last century. Well, yeah, I mean, not only that, but just the obsession of bloodlines and ruling class and all that stuff goes back to these headed, the big headed people. And that supports the fact that, you know, they they had some sort of claim to royalty. It wasn't like, oh, I am just this smart person. It's like, no, my bloodline goes all the way back to these right. 20 foot tall, crazy rulers. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what they're up against. So, yeah, the bloodlines thing. The megaliths, it's all tied to blurry creatures. It all, it, it, In my mind, it all goes back to Bigfoot as the beginning of, like, here we have this creature still walking around in the forest, which is like a, a window into the ancient world. That's yeah. what I think it is. It's a window into the ancient world that there's something out there that isn't right, that you have to look deeper. You have to find this truth. And some people go, oh, that's crazy. How do you get to megaliths from Bigfoot? And I'm just like, well, we just did. 
in my mind. <laughs> we just did. <laughs> that's that's the journey, right? Because you start going back and you start going, well, what is this thing in the Pacific Northwest? And does it have supernatural abilities? Because it seems like these creatures of old had supernatural abilities. They built this stuff with supernatural tools, it sounds like. Like, you know, I, I built things. I've, I've used diamond cut blades and saws. Or, I mean, not even like supernatural tools, but maybe just supernatural knowledge to build stuff yeah but it's not anti-science and it's not pseudoscience and that's what people love to say whenever they they can't understand oh these guys are pseudoscience it's not yeah. there's evidence there's real skulls there's and, and brian says five percent of those are not head wrap we're talking about no sagittal suture and yeah. the way that the actual spine the spinal column connects into the to the skull is actually you know an inch and a half from where it should be and bigger eyes these are these are actual real i mean you can touch and not all of us can go touch them, but you can go see and look at these things that, that are fantastically real. But pokes a huge hole in a lot of a lot of the you know what you find in your history book and what's accepted as as truth in the scientific community. The people who seem to be and this seems really 2020. The people standing on the mountaintop shouting, "You are wrong! You are wrong!" The people shouting, "Anti! You are anti-science! You people over here are actually anti-science. They are the ones." who are anti-science. They are the ones who are afraid to look at the skulls. They are the ones who are afraid to look at the data. They are the ones who have prescribed to their own dogma and don't want science. They don't want science. They, they don't want to look at it. They don't want to look at the truth. And they're right. the anti-science community. Uh, and they and they yell at everyone else. Oh, you're anti-vaxxer. You're racist. You're blah, blah, blah. But really, it's like, no, you're the one being the thing you're yelling about that's what it is right and i would always say beware of beware be wary of someone that continually tells tells you they're the smartest person in the room because they're most likely not in the same way you know beware of the people that tell you that they can absolutely trust you with no with no, you can trust them without any without any evidence because most likely they're selling you something that, that it isn't true yeah and if if i was in a room i'd be talking to brian forrester because that guy sounds dude that guy's <laughs> awesome He's like a, he's like the Robert Redford Indiana Jones. You gotta see this guy. Check out his videos. I mean, he literally is Robert Redford Indiana Jones, and yeah, the guy's out yeah. there doing it. He's out there touching touching the the megaliths. He's he's putting his hands on the stones, and um, he's doing the work out there. That um, he's super fortunate to to have that opportunity, and is also one of the pioneers of really pushing pushing upstream against. You know, people that just don't want to hear this for whatever reason. And we're not, I'm not going to put any reasons or names or anything onto that, but whatever reason, there's a lot of resistance to people opening their worldview and opening their minds um, to there being things that don't that don't flow downstream when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for tuning tuning into this episode of Blurry Creatures. We had a lot of fun. Leave us a review on iTunes. Getting Brian on was a huge deal for this show, and your support really helps us get there. So um, send us an email, blurrycreaturespodcast at gmail, and uh, leave that review. I will say it a million times, but that, that, that's, the, that's the way. Trying to work that algorithm, baby. And uh, as you know, Luke would have been accepted in the Incas because he was a good-looking man, and they would have put you right in charge. There, might have been taller than all of them by about a foot, so maybe they, <laughs> they, they would have. <laughs> only, only if you're attractive would, did you get the invitation. So Well, you have red yeah. hair, so you would have been obviously <laughs> in, right? I, I don't know. I would have been walking around like, well, I don't know. Well, if I had a yeah. Blurry creatures hosted by the ruling class of the Incan Empire. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. Till next time. <laughs> <laughs>